All right, guys, we're back. It's episode number 44. We finally got the man, Matthew LaCroix, on. We're going to go deep into the Anunnaki. He's going to teach us all about it because, you know, JP and I have talked about it many times on previous episodes. We're excited about having him on. And we don't know much about it, but this guy is a wealth of knowledge. And he comes to us from our, our buddy, Jeffrey Wilson, who's been on um, once or twice. And he's been on my other podcast once. And we've had Pat Mills to join as well. Um, so our networking of awesomeness got us this great guy. And we're looking forward to learning about this. JP's out for this episode. He's at a family reunion uh, slash camping. So it's going to be just me and Matthew. I'm going to do my best. Uh, he's real willing to just work with me because I don't know much. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Matthew. Hey, it's great to be here, E. Willie. Um, I'm looking forward to, you know, digging into some of these topics and expanding on some of the areas that you are you brought up. I, I guess you could call this like a, an Anunnaki one-on-one, right? Yep. That's what we're going to call this episode, Anunnaki, Anunnaki 101, because... And we're all, I, I know a lot of the listeners contact me regularly and a lot of them are interested in this and I don't know how many of us actually know much about this. So I'm looking forward to going deep in it. Where would you start off with somebody who's new to all this? Like what's a good starting point? Okay. Forgive me for those who listen to this that are well-versed on this subject, but today we're going to start from the beginning for all those people who don't know really much about this subject or they're on the fence about it. And it's something that they're curious about, um, and they're looking for some evidence to sway their, to persuade them a little bit with what's real and what's not real. That based on what we're going to go over today, I'm going to try to really provide some of the, um, I guess you could call them the, the breadcrumbs to follow for all the evidence that I think really points to a very, very lost, a lost chapter of our, of our story, a lost chapter of, of our epic of our planet mankind and all the things that have happened here since the age of the dinosaurs you know millions of years ago our planet was very very different than it is today but what about all the things that happened in between you know how far back does the our story the human story go and is there is there something else that's involved in this story that makes it a lot more interesting than we really have been told in this narrative and doctrine that we go through school with learning about this Rockefeller type viewpoint of history where these are certain designated ways that we perceive things. And that perception of history is very, very, I consider it very dumbed down, very basic. Um, it really doesn't give people a lot of interest in a lot of people that I know, at least. Mm -hmm. They, when I bring up something like that, I do a lot of ancient history studying, they sort of roll their eyes like it's boring. And, and right. I get that. I understand why it might be perceived as boring if one was to just take this book that we're, that we're given in, in school and be like, oh, I'm curious about this area based on what I've learned. But it's, it's so much more interesting than that. This, this story that makes up our lost past is, is so um, profound that it has taken me on a journey that's changed my life forever. And I, I can tell people you know, that are listening that might not know who I am or my work. Um, I really wasn't studying this type of area when I was younger. I was just someone who was very open-minded and spent a lot, of, a lot of time outside hiking, just a lot of time in the outdoors, pushing myself in, a, in the physical world to try to see what I could accomplish and to get away from people because I felt very isolated with my type of thought process where it just didn't seem like a lot of people we're thinking about the stars and thinking about these big questions about, you know, if we're alone in the universe and, you know, how far back our story goes. And it just seemed like most people weren't that interested. And so I sought to go into the wilderness and just leave society behind because I was so frustrated with the state of people's, I guess you could call them awareness and consciousness. And so that's, I guess that's where this whole story began because I've always been incredibly curious and, and I guess, amazed when I, when I see documentaries on ancient civilizations and the structures and the things that they built. And, so, and some of these ancient texts that were left behind, when I started to dig into that a little bit and just at, at a curiosity's sake, I re wasn't really expecting to be taken on this journey that really could changes your entire paradigm of how you view reality and history. The way that it did, it was sort of an um, it, it, it was unexpected that it happened, but when it did, once I started to become curious about looking at our history in a different way, it opened up a lot of doors to perceive 
everything in, in a different way because the first question that, that came up, and, it, and it's a difficult question to accept in terms of asking it and then accepting the, what, that, what that answer is, is have we been lying or has there been sort of a misdirection of what history is in, in our story and all the way back to the very beginning. And, and once I said clearly after looking at it, yes, you know, there's a lot that we're not being told and there's a lot that we need to go out and uncover ourselves to understand. Then, then all of those doors were opened and there wasn't really anything holding me back because I was open-minded to exploring everything, you know, what is real and what wasn't real. And when I started to ask the question of, well, if I wanted to learn the story of us, the story of how far back we go, the first ancient writings that were ever written, I would want to go back to the very first one that, 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 were ever, that was ever written. I want to go back to the earliest versions of them so that you could have the most pure text. Mm -hmm. Because what we find, E. Willie, over time was that a lot of ancient stories became woven into religious stories today. And a lot of the information within them became um, really muddied and really lost a lot of the genuineness that it once had. And I started to ask questions about things like, well, what, what is the Bible talking about with a lot of these strange stories about in, in the past with giants and a lot of these odd things that it mentions if you actually read it? And I'm not a religious person at all. But I remember when I was earlier in school, learning about some of these odd things, I always like scratched my head wondering whether or not they were talking about something real or something just metaphoric, and symbolic. And right. it wasn't until that I started to seek out the most ancient, earliest text that we have, that it, this story sort of unfolded that changed my entire life. And that story is derived from when you look back at the most um, extensive collection of ancient writings that we have today. And most people have never even heard of them. And that those set of texts are called Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets. And I don't know if you're, are you familiar at all, E. Willie, with cuneiform tablets at all? Is this no, something I've, you can I've heard of the emerald tablets. I don't know if that's related to it or not, but I don't, I really don't know much about this stuff. So this is all kind of brand new to me. Okay. So a ball of clay shaped me. <laughs> all right. Well, I like that, Willie. That's, that's great. And in fact, that's one of the terms that some of the ancients used was that oh, well. clay, because you could mold clay into, into the image that you wanted it to. It was, it was a very powerful way that they would describe things, including us. So if, let me, I guess I'll start from the beginning here. If you were to leave a message behind for thousands of years, not hundreds of years, thousands of years, like if you were like on your desk right now and you're talking to me, you grab a piece of paper and you grab a pen or a pencil and you write some information down and you go and you take that and you go put it like in a safe or something, right? And you're like, okay, this is going to be a time capsule so that I can write down some information about what I'm like and what I, my perception of this time period. And maybe long in the future, and let's say you bury it, right? Like a time capsule is. Let's say you want people to read about what you wrote thousands and thousands of years from now. Into the future, who knows what's going to happen, right? Would that piece of paper that you wrote that down, would it, how long would it, would it last? You know, how long would, would it really survive? Let's say you had some disaster that occurred here where it was buried under the ground and you know the safe broke open and the paper got wet and then just deteriorated right after a couple hundred years it's gone mm -hmm. that message you left behind that you're hoping someone in the future would read too bad it's it just it disappeared and no one is ever going to find it again well these ancient cultures were so sophisticated and this is this is evidence behind their sophistication was they saw way ahead of that and they they thought to themselves well, we can't write on a cave wall with paint because it's going to disappear eventually. It's not very effective. We can't write anything down because paper disappears and all those things disappear. So what can you do to preserve a message? Well, the brilliant thing they came up with was if you have clay, and there's the coming to the clay thing we we're talking about. If you have clay and you take that piece of clay and you etch a, mes a message into it in like a three-dimensional version, you, you etch that message into it, and then you take that clay and you bake it in, a, in, a, in an oven. You get what's known as a cuneiform tablet. And cuneiform is the most ancient type of writing that we know of today. It is the earliest form of writing. In fact, it's a Sumerian and cuneiform is a dead language. When these tablets were first discovered, 
nobody knew how to translate them for, for many years because it was a dead language. No one had spoken it. So when I, the, the point I'm trying to make here is the, the Mesopotamians, especially the Sumerians and Akkadians, which are found in what's modern day Iraq today, that area of Iraq where all this conflict has been for so long. Those are, are the most advanced um, civilization that we have extensive writings from in the world. There's no other ancient culture that predates them that left behind such an extensive record of what was going on in their world and how they perceived the things that were happening. So when I started to read these cuneiform tablets and the stories that they contained, it completely changed my life because it wasn't really what I expected. I wasn't, I was expecting maybe just to read about daily life, you know, like how laws and rules were created and then, well, people, this kingdom came up and fought another kingdom, right? And then some other king came to rule. That's the extent of what I expected, but that's not what they, that's not the only thing that they uncover. These stories, these tablets um, basically explain this entire lost period of human history that was destroyed in a great set of uh, catastrophes that occurred on the earth. And, and they talk about that in these tablets. And then they state that basically humanity and civilization had to be restarted because of these cataclysms that happened. And that's why we're uncovering information that is in some ways completely foreign and lost to us from another time period. But the real, the real kicker, the real interesting aspect of it is that these weren't primitive people. This was a very sophisticated society. And that's where the, the real interest comes into this because it presents this viewpoint of the world more than 10,000 years ago when there were these gods that they called them that descended down from heaven that they called the Anunnaki. And this is what these cuneiform tablets are the most famous for because there are thousands of them and only a few hundred of them have been translated, but in them contain detailed accounts and stories of deities, beings, whatever you want to call them that came here and basically created civilization in the image of, that they wanted it to be in and then left behind all of these incredible stories of all these things that happened that, and then were, were destroyed. And then it states that these great beings or gods departed during these cataclysms because they were so violent. And so we were basically left to fend on our own and restart everything. And that's where this whole story gets incredibly complicated and amazing. Um, so is, that's where... I guess we can start. And now, E. Will, if you want, I can get into some of the details of, you know, what that means and how that really accounts for our story. Yeah, I got a, a couple of questions before I go too fur too much further. Yeah, sure. Um, why do you think it is that, it, that this all started and rooted in that one part of the earth, like the Middle East area? Is there any well, reason? That area is one of the geographic centers of our world. It's interesting when you look at Mesopotamia and places like Egypt. It's found right in the center of our planet. And it seemed like that was something that was important because some, we've had so many time periods in history where if you don't know E. Willie, what happens to our earth is we go through cycles um, roughly every 10 to 20,000 years where we go through a warming and a cooling of the planet. And you often get ice ages that develop across the Northern and Southern hemispheres, which would make civilization building and creating civilizations impossible because it would be too hostile and it'd be covered in ice. You know, I mention this every time I talk about this, but it's, it's fascinating to consider that you and I talking right now. Um, and in fact, where you live as well, um, here in Maine, I had one to two miles of ice above my head only 10 to 11,000 years ago. And just imagine how colossal that is on the landscape and how that might impede being able to, have a society flourish in certain parts of the world. And so that's why places like the Middle East, um, Africa, were so desired because they were the most stable places that civilization could uh, okay. develop for long periods of time without being impacted by great ice ages and disasters that came along with them. Right. That makes sense. That's very cool. Um, the other question was um, the, the destruction that they all went through during this time period. Was that something they did cause on, them, on each other? Was it a natural disaster or are you going to get into that later? I'll get into that later, but okay. then, that's a very complicated answer. It looks like it might've been a combination of both. Okay. And cool. um, 
a lot of people have argued that or, or debated that whether or not these beings created this disaster or they just knew it was going to happen and they allowed it to happen. And I think it, or even some other consensus is that there may have been some other disasters caused by um, a mismanagement of energy, we'll call it. And we can, okay. we can get into that as we go. It's um, it goes a little, a little deep here, but for we right. up. So let me, you will, let me start so people can understand where this all began. I already laid the, the framework for this. Mes remember, Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets are the oldest known form of writing, sophisticated writing that we have in the world. And there are, um, there are basically extensive libraries. Now, the most important library that was ever discovered, which is where this whole story begins, was it begins in 1849. Now, that's important to point out because I'm going to jump a little bit ahead on that date because I want you to remember that date, 1849. Because today, in this perception, if you were to go online and search for the Anunnaki and search for these stories that we're about to go into, you're going to come across a man named Zechariah Sitchin. Now, Zechariah Sitchin was one of these individuals that was, was the first to really write in extensive detail about these tablets. Now, he made a lot of bold claims in his books. I'm sure you've heard of that before. So when I read those, my mind was blown. But I asked myself, is, is this entire thing credible? That's the first thing I asked myself is, is it credible? And so when I had read those, I decided, okay, I'm going to stop here and go back. I'm going to go back and I'm going to research and read these tablets myself because I want to know the story. The story that they tell is so fantastic and so incredible that we're about to lay out that I needed credible evidence myself before I could accept it. And that's why this is so important because some of the information Zechariah Sitchin translated was inaccurate. Some of it, I, I'd say roughly 50%. It, it means that people took the terms that he used and their perception developed rampant online where the term Anunnaki and all of the information associated with that was fake and made up by Zechariah Sitchin. And I want to tell you 100% what we're about to go over right now explains the things that he, he got wrong and the things that he got right. But the point is, the, the base story that he wrote, the base story in terms of a beings coming here and manipulating our reality and having an effect on our past is accurate. So this is where it really starts. Let's get the actual evidence to lay it down. Let's, let's begin with the very beginning. In 1849, archaeologists were in the Iraq area, this, an ancient city called Nineveh. And they were digging down like in something out of a movie. They were digging down in, this, in, these, in this, these ruins of a, of a city that was once there called Nineveh. And they found this gi giant library, this massive library of tablets, these cuneiform um, baked clay tablets. Wow. They, they didn't just find a few of them. They found 30,000 cuneiform Damn. tablets that have all of these incredible stories about thousands and thousands of years of human history recorded in these tablets, okay? And so Austin Henry Laird, who, who made the discovery in 1849, he takes this massive catcher of, of, of tablets and he says, I, I, can't, I can't read this. I can't, I'm not a seriologist. I can't translate these. So they, they took the tablets to the University of Oxford in England and they remained there for a number of years. And they asked the world and they asked professionals, you know, who could study and learn ancient Sumerian, which is what these were left behind from. This region was the first known culture was called the Sumerians, later followed up by the Akkadians and then Babylonians. And those cultures died out and then thousands of years went by and then other cultures emerged in those areas, contrary to what we're told in school. And those, those cultures were so ancient and, and that, that language had died out so long ago that nobody knew how to translate it. Nobody even knew, knew how to read it, okay? So when this doctrine we're told in, in our history books, we're told that human civilization began six, around 6,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia, which they are right about the location, but they're wrong about the date. And one of the things I lay out, E. Willie, is that I've put together a 200,000 year timeline of our history based on all the evidence that I'm gonna be laying out. 
And I've presented that a number of times and that timeline is available on my website at the stage of time.com, which I encourage people to check out because I place all these dates because what I had to do, E. Willie, was since this doctrine was inaccurate, incredibly inaccurate on our past, it wasn't, it wasn't that I found that the story was a little more than 6,000 years old. I found that it was a lot more than 6,000 years old, wow. well over double. And it, it spanned such a massive time period that it looks like this story, instead of going back only 6,000 years with civilization, actually goes through different epics that go more than 50,000 years, well over 50,000 years. And there's an entire gap where human civilization had to basically restart itself again here. And all of that ancient lost sophisticated technology remained. And that's what we're going to get into now. So Austin, Austin, Austin Henry Laird takes these tablets to the University of Oxford and they remain there until a very important man comes along, which I hope the, the history books really credit him in the future as being a great hero of, of us, of, of ancient history and our story. His name was George Smith. George Smith was the first Assyriologist in the world to master the Akkadian Sumerian language. He learned how to, how to read cuneiform fluently. And he was the first person in, in thousands of years to learn how to read it. And he went to this giant catch of, of tablets at the University of Oxford, and he started to translate them one by one. And when, when he got to the first tablet, the first one ended up being the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the most famous stories of our, of our time that is one of the few that is actually mentioned in, 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 our, in our school books. When he got to that and he started reading it, he started to run around basically yelling is what the description was because he realized that he had found an entire lost time period of human history that explained um, all kinds of different aspects of how sophisticated we once were and all the influences that we had that became lost. And it was like this glimpse, this time capsule, Willie, that it had remained and survived for not only 10,000 years, but looks like well over 10, maybe 20,000 years. These tablets were, were, were first written and they tell a story that, that we can get into right now. This is exciting stuff, man. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you're, you're enjoying My brain's it. like a sponge right now, so just keep going. <laughs> okay. These stories that I'm about to go over are echoed by many other texts across the world later on. Ancient Hindu and Vedic texts. Um, hermetic texts, the, the texts that come out of Greece, um, like Hermes coming, coming out of the, the ancient Greek Egyptian area, Hermes, Book of the Dead, ta looking into ancient Egyptian Gnostic Hindu culture, they echo this very same story. But this is where it, very, this is where it begins. This, the tablets tell us, and we're going to start with a tablet called the Atrahasis. That was a tablet that, was, that came out of the Ashurbanipal Library, which is what I told you about that came out of Nineveh when they discovered it. And that Ashurbanipal Paul Library is still on display at the University of Oxford today. However, what I want, the point I want to try to make for those that think that this information is just out there and, and obvious to everybody, out of the 30,000 tablets that I'm about to go into some of them, most of them still remain untranslated today. George Smith wasn't able to translate all of them because there's just too many. He died. And then what, um, subsequently, over a hundred years later, another um, expert Assyriologist named Stephanie Daly came along from the University of Oxford and she took George Smith's work and then verified it. And so what we're about to go over has been verified by the best ancient translators in the world. And what the story states is, long ago, there were beings, and I don't want to wrap around the term alien, beings, that's all they state. They state that they came here from heaven higher dimensions beyond our realm. They came here and they descended down to, to our earth and they decided that they would stay here. Okay. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to actually read part of one of these tablets, Willie, so you can actually see what it says. So it's not just me blabbering on about what, might, what it might or might, might not say. So the first tablet we're going we're gonna to read a, a section from is called the Atrahasis. And it's the great flood hero that became the biblical story of Noah. And that, that hero's name wasn't, wasn't really Noah in these tablets. His name was um, 
a combination depending on the culture that you read them in. In Babylonian, he was Zaya Sudra in the Epic of Gilgamesh. But in other stories, um, Assyriologist stories further to the north from Nineveh, he was known as Untapishti or um, Atrahasis. He was a great king that came out of one of these cities in Mesopotamia. And he writes in one of these tablets that came out, he gives an account of the world at the time. He was a king. He wasn't just a peasant. He was a great royal king from a royal bloodline. And, that, and we're going to expand on that as I go along. And Atra, what Atrahasis says on the first tablet, on tablet number one, is when the gods instead of man did the work, bore the loads, the god's load was too great, the work too hard, the trouble too much. They took and cast the lots. The gods made the division. Anu went up in the sky, and Enlil took the earth for his people. And these are the Anunnaki we're talking about. Anu had gone up in the sky, and the gods of the Abzu had gone below. And I'll explain what that means. The Anunnaki of the sky made the Ajiji bear the workload. The Ajiji gods had to dig out canals, had to clear channels, the lifelines of the land. For 3,600 years, they bore the excess. They groaned and blamed each other. Come, let us carry Enlil, the counselor of the gods, the warrior, from his dwelling and get him to relieve us of our hard work. The Ajiji set fire to their tools, put aside the spades for fire. When they reached the gate of warrior Enlil's dwelling, it was night, the middle watch. A Kerr was surrounded. Enlil had not realized. A Kerr was an ancient city in Mesopotamia. Enlil sent for Anu to be brought down to him. Enki was fetched in his presence. Anu, king of the sky, was present. Enki, king of the Absu, attended. All of the great Anunnaki were present. The Ajiji declared, every single one of us has declared war. We have put a stop to the digging. The load is excessive. It is killing us. Anu made his voice heard and spoke to God's his brothers. What are we complaining of? Their work was indeed too hard. Their trouble too much. Ea made his voice heard and spoke, let us create a mortal man so that he may bear the yoke, the work of Enlil. Let man bear the load of the gods. Nintu made her voice heard and spoke. On the seventh, the first seventh and fifteenth of the month, I shall make a purification by washing. Then one god, one god shall be slaughtered. Then a god and a man will be mixed together in clay. Let a ghost come into existence from the god's flesh. And let the ghost exist so as not to forget the slain god. So that's tablet one of one of these tablets, okay, just one of them. And in that tablet, it's, it's very difficult to understand exactly what they're saying unless you study it in a very metaphorical, symbolic way, but also a literal way in some cases. And that's what's made these so difficult to decipher and understand because they, they talked in such an advanced type of way where they right. wanted to sometimes reference many different things in the same word. Now, let me break this down, E. Willie, for you. It starts out by saying that they came here, okay? It says that they came here, and they had a lot of work to do. What did that mean? Well, it says that the Ajiji had to dig out canals, the lifelines of the land. Now, this is what I, my bread and butter. I decided to just spend a considerable amount of time studying these to figure out what exactly they say because no one's out there telling us. And this is what I've come up with based on all the evidence that I've looked at and, and really trying to get, get to be a, somewhat of an expert on if I can. It states that they had to clear out the canals, the lifelines of land. Well, Mesopotamia was called the Fertile Crescent because it was one of the most fertile agricultural areas in, in the world. And what that means is in Iraq, there's two important rivers called the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And they come together and they create a very fertile area to grow crops. Well, why does that matter? Well, if you have a civilization, the way you, you have to have certain types of blueprints, certain types of things to create a civilization. And the first thing you need to separate yourself from being nomadic, nomadic hunter gatherer is you need to have an agricultural system. It's the only way you can feed your people and create something, some kind right. of a civilization. So the Sumerians, the people that wrote these tablets, in them, they don't state that they created all these things. When you read in your history books, 
Where did the first agriculture in the world ever come from? Where did mathematics, astrology, astronomy, where did everything come from that makes up the fabric of our, of our, of our knowledge of this reality? Sumer in Mesopotamia. But they don't state that they came up with it. They state that these beings that descended gave them all of this knowledge to help them jumpstart civilization, to create these, these cities around different regions, and then they could basically rule over them. So what does that mean? Well, in Mesopotamia, they created agriculture was the first place they ever created it there. And they were taking the rivers and clearing the channels out. If you don't know, if when you're using rivers for agriculture, the ancient Egyptians did this with the Nile as well. Those rivers that go through very um, dry areas, they get filled with sediment and, and sand and silt as they travel over the land. If you don't clear them out, they, they keep filling and they eventually you lose your water supply and they, the river almost disappears eventually. That ha that's what happens. So when they, me they meant by this hard work is these the Gigi were literally clearing these giant river channels out. Why? Because there had been disasters in the past that had filled them with sediment. And to create a viable civilization, you had to have the ability to have these river systems for agriculture. So the Gigi worked for 3,600 years, creating the infrastructure of this region. That's what that means. Now, whether the Gigi, they're a non-royal version of the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki just means those who from heaven came to earth. Earth was known as Ki, K-I. That's why their name is Anunnaki. Anu mm. is the head of them, their royal status of their the beings. And so it's called Anunnaki. And that name wasn't, that name was the, what the Sumerians called them. But what they call themselves in the text is either the Anunnaki or Anuna. That's the two names that they use themselves, that they refer to themselves with. And it's this umbrella of what in the Enuma, in the Enuma Elish claims is 300 of them. There are 300 of them. That's what it states. And the non-royal version of them were known as the Ajiji. Okay. So the IGI, the IGI, um, I -G -I -G -I, okay. IGG. Wow. So the IGG were doing all of this work here, but they were basically like demigods, almost like the Anunnaki, like gods, powerful beings. And they, they felt like they, they, they felt like they didn't deserve to do that work because they were superior beings that didn't want to do that. And so what did they do? They revolted. Like that classic story. They didn't want to do it anymore. So Enki, also known as Ia, he decided he had this great idea, which some say he perhaps had all along because he was known as a master creator. He was the greatest of all of the Anunnaki in terms of intelligence. And so what he did is he was known as the creator. They grouped together and they decided to take their essence and take a hominid that was found on the planet. That's why there's so much confusion with our story. They took a Neanderthal or a Denisovian or a combination of both. And they took their essence and they created us in their image. Just like um, Genesis states in the Bible, how mankind was created in their image, plural. Their, it doesn't say God in singular, it says their image. All of these angels and demons are simply just these Anunnaki beings playing the role all throughout history. It's the same thing. Damn. They are essentially created us to be like these demigods, like the Ajiji, but they wiped our memory and they had it so that we basically didn't, wouldn't understand who, our divinity of who we really were. And we would be sort of trapped here doing their work while they remained in basically like higher dimensions. It seems like, I know that's a mouthful and that's like hard to wrap your head around, but I'm going to expand on that as we go along. So what does it say here at the end? This is where it gets really mind blowing for anyone who understands and looks into what our reality is, how there are non so many non-physical aspects of our reality based on what's beyond the visible light spectrum that we really are like moles here. We can only perceive such a small fraction of what's going on all around us with dimensions and dark matter and all the things that are happening that we're like that blind mole. We only have a limited amount of senses we can perceive seven colors in the visible light spectrum and everything else is beyond us. So therefore we have um, 
strong limitations being a physical mortal being here. Remember, it says make a mortal man, not a man who it can go from non-physical to physical. Create a mortal man here, but we are something much more than that because there is a, there's something called consciousness, the spirit. And now it says something ju just about right about that in here too. At the end, it says, then one God shall be slaughtered. So their blood was one of these gods blood was, was taken to create us. And that's where the whole idea of obsession over Royal bloodlines to this day still comes into play with this because it has to do with the genetics that were left over from long ago. Now, what does it say after that? Then a God and a man will be mixed together in clay. See? So it took this Anunnaki archetype with their, all their gifts and then mixed it with this hominid that was compatible and created us in their image. Then it says, let a ghost come into existence from the God's flesh and let that ghost exist so as not to forget the slain God. So our consciousness, our spirit, they literally animated this, this like a Frankenstein type of thing, animated this thing to then have our consciousness be incarnated in here. And then boom, we wake up. And we're in this reality and we don't know where the heck we came from. We don't remember anything. And then we have to go through these toils of life, just like the Gigi we're complaining about. And we don't understand anything. That's, and that's what these stories go on. But they don't just state that, E-Willie. They go on, tablet two and three of the Atrahasis states that then great kingdoms were created. These, these, king, these kingdoms based on kings ruling that had these royal bloodlines from the Anunnaki. And when you read things like the Sumerian King List, which is another famous cuneiform tablet, it breaks down the first cities ever created, who ruled over them, how long they were ruled by. This isn't mythological. This is literal. It's telling us about ancient cities that are long ago gone where great king, great, great bloodline royal kings ruled here and created civilizations in this archetype image that they were supposed to. And that's, that's where the story just keeps going deeper and, and deeper. I know you probably have some questions. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible, man. Hang on, I'm tied up in my mic real quick. Let's see. Um, man, this, there's so many questions. I'm probably going to have to just digest this whole episode. And then when you get you back on the second one, we'll unload 100 questions on you. Okay. Now, in these tablets... The Sumerian king list ends with talking about a city called Shurupak. And what's amazing about that is that the, ki the last king of Shurupak was this character, Atrahasis, that I just read you a piece of that story from. So it's not just a figure that's not real. These are real you know, flesh and blood people that were around at one point, and then they left behind these incredible stories. What, um, what he talks about, this king, besides the creation of mankind, which is, which is talked about in many other tablets as well, is he talks about how things became a little out of control here and led to a, a reset being, being needed. And this is what is echoed also in Genesis. He states that Shurupak was the last great city known as the antediluvial, meaning pre-flood, pre this great event known as the, the Great Deluge seems to be this great, this large point where it separated these different epics of human history. And in the story, the Tablet 2, 3 of Atrahasis, he talks about how humanity reached this certain point, this golden age, where we became much more sophisticated. And then everything was basically destroyed. And he, because he was a bloodline king, he was one of the only individuals who was warned that a great cataclysm was, was, was coming. Now, what cataclysm was that? Well, I mentioned that our earth goes through periods of cooling and warming as part of a natural cycle of the sun. It was what's known as a grand, in a, a grand solar maximum and a grand solar minimum. It has to do with solar output as well as the position of where our earth is over these courses of different cycles. Now, just jumping ahead a little bit, you find ancient temples all around the world that are from the same time period where you can, you can re tell the difference based on the sophistication of those temples with the building techniques, as well as radiocarbon dating, that when they go in and they date these structures, they're finding that they're over 11,000 years old, proving 
that the entire story that we're given at school is, is, is made up. It's not real. There is, we already, we have radiocarbon dating from these ancient sites that is telling us that these sites are older than 10,000 years ago, meaning that the, they were around before this great disaster happened. Well, how do we know there was a disaster, disaster 10, 000, 10 to 12,000 years ago? When we study ice core samples from Greenland, which give us a snapshot of what the climate was like, and we look at other sediment levels around the world and, and aspects of things like ocean rise and fall over, over the last 10 to 12,000 years, we see some startlingly shocking things when we look at that. And what we find is that 10 to 12,000 years ago, ocean levels were 400 feet lower than they are today. 400 wow. feet, Willie. Just imagine right now, like, right, you, you say goodbye to me. You're like, hey, great show, Matt. I'm going to head down to the beach and just ponder all the things you just told me. And you drive down to the ocean, which is a long drive for you, being where you're <laughs> located. But you eventually get there, and you're sitting there, and you're looking up back at the, at, at the coast and at the hills. Imagine what 400 feet difference peering out in the ocean would be like around our world. And at the same time, you go off of places like Egypt and India and maybe the, off of Bahamas, Cuba, we're finding structures underwater that were built, sophisticated structures underwater that are covered in seawater. Well, if they, were, if they were built there, it means that they're older than when sea levels changed, right? Mm -hmm. That proves to you once again that those structures were older than 10 to 12,000 years ago because they became flooded. Now, what happened? Well, we had an ice age during this period that predated the Younger Dryas. We had a period called the Pleistocene, which was a time period when the Earth went into a grand solar minimum and massive ice fields formed in the northern and southern hemisphere. This is only 11 to 12,000 years ago. That was the ice I talked about that was above my head. Well, instead of the way we've been made to be, believe that it slowly melted and then we came to the place we're at, Remember in school when you learned about how there was all kinds of species that were around during the ice age, remember mm -hmm. saber tooth tigers and woolly mammoths. Remember all right. those things just disappeared. They're what was known. They were known as megafauna across the Northern hemisphere. Randall Carlson has done a great job covering this area. So does um, Graham Hancock. So I want to give, give them kudos for that. But what, what Randall talks about is that these megafauna disappeared from the areas that were close to where the ice um, used to be during the last ice age, gone, extinct, wiped out. The only megafauna that survived were down in places like Africa, like elephants, and down towards the center of the earth. Why? Because when you look at those Green, Greenland ice core records, you find out that, that ice, those ice caps melted instantly, liquidated basically. And you see evidence of that in the Northwest United States with massive canyons that were formed off of the Atlantic seaboard. You find that all across the Northern hemisphere, you see these places where massive amounts of water have outflowed very quickly in the past. And, no, and, and it's no coincidence that nearly every one of these ancient stories, whether or not you wanna talk about this, the Atrahasis and other cuneiform tablets to ancient Hindu and Vedic texts, all the way to Gnostic texts and, and many others around the world to the Hopi, they all talk about this great deluge that wiped everything out. And then only the survivors had to continue on. And that was that destructive event. The ice caps basically liquidated, massive outflows occurred, ocean levels rose 400 feet, and it looks like the tectonic plates were shifting and the, the north and south pole that, that balances the, the magnetic sphere of the earth was mm -hmm. wobbling and moving what's called a pole shift and you had all kinds of apocalyptic events that looks like it, it, it occurred during this time period and it wiped out what was not just a civilization in mesopotamia e willie but a civilization that may have covered all around the world and i know that's hard to wrap our heads around but when we connect what plato talked about with atlantis a great civilization that was destroyed and then all these other very strange and sophisticated structures from egypt all the way to South America, right through Easter Island and around the world, we find these incredibly sophisticated building structures that are so precise that you can't fit a human hair in between the grooves. Damn. We're not talking about mortar that was used. We're talking about tools 
that were beyond anything that, that would have been possible according to the hardness scale of those structures. It's something that to this day, some of the precision that's seen in places like Pumapunku in, in the Bolivia, Peru area, in Tiwanaku, we can't even recreate that today. Just try to wrap your head around that. In some ways, this global civilization was more advanced than we were, but not in a computer technological way, in ways of understanding energy and cycles in the earth that we just don't understand today. And that's why in many ways, we, our society has gone down a road where we've really lost connection with so many things that the ancients ha once had, and they warn us countless times in those about that. So what happened? These disasters occurred. They wiped out these civilizations. And getting back to what Audre Hase says, and I'll go right to it, E. Willie, Audre Hase states that because he was part of a, a, a rare bloodline, a, an ancient royal bloodline, that he was warned, and he was one of the only ones that was warned. But it goes deeper than that. These creator god beings, they state that this event had to occur because of what was known as a crossbreeding that occurred between these gods and humans later on, which the Bible referred to as the Nephilim, which became what we think of as ancient kings that were like giants, tall, very, very tall some of these strange elongated skulls that we're seeing out of Paracas, Peru, that, that we've been, that Brian Forster and other individuals have been testing genetically, and they're not from cranium enlargement. They're genetically taller. Why does that matter? Cultures like the Inca, the royal culture, th around 3,000 years ago, were trying to imitate some past culture before them ancient culture that had tall heads and were very tall beings and seemed to live much longer. They were trying to imitate them. Why would they do that? Unless there were these certain bloodline genetics that were left over. And because they were disruptive in creating kings that, and this is hard for people to wrap their heads around, the Sumerian king list claims that some of these kings were ruling for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Blow your mind trying to perceive that. That means that humans once could live much, much longer than, than we do now. And we had like a genetic downgrade or the blood lines became so muted over time and we, and we lost so much, so much of that essence that we eventually fell back to the state where we are now, where we remember very little of it. And we'd only live to like 120 years right now, right? So in, in the in Natrahasis, he he goes on to basically describe this great flood that he was going to warn was going to happen. And this is where it gets to this biblical notion that he was told that if he didn't create some kind of a cedar craft that had a top on it to block out, to be able to go in there, that he would not survive. That's what it says. And so he went and he gathered together his family and some of the genetics that they had within their, their crops and animals. And they brought them on sure enough, this massive cataclysm occurred and he washes up on this mountain, just like we're told in a biblical sense. And he's, he emerges on this, this world where the oceans are like receding, like some apocalyptic movie. And these gods descend and Enlil, one of the gods, which I haven't even gone into yet, for, for, uh, forgive me, mentions, you know, this human survives. He wasn't supposed to survive this deluge. It was supposed to be a reset to wipe out this entire creation of mankind but oops they didn't they survived and that's how we became to still be here today we were according to these tablets a creation to basically toil here for them but we we became too intelligent and too our genetics too much like them and we became like a threat to be even greater than them and so they wanted to wipe us out to start start over again here okay now i'm getting a little ahead of myself i know that's a mouthful to try to wrap your head around that but that's how we got into the state we're in today, where so much of this information became lost and buried. And, we, and then we, we, we got into this um, point where it was being argued over what's real. And then there even came, got secret societies got involved into some were fighting over what information could be, could be protected and what information should be destroyed. Groups like the Roman Empire went, went through and just and burned down libraries and captured a lot of this information. And then here we are today, places like the Vatican archives in Italy, in Rome, is this library where you can even see articles that have been on the news where they have all this forbidden text and information down there that they don't want people to know about. 
it's hard not to go down the road of conspiracy when you see so much all around you that mm-hmm. seems to be deliberately hidden so that we don't, we don't really discover it, that we don't understand it because it paints this picture of our past that is so incredible that it redefines really who we are and it redefines this entire experiment here. Now, let me, let me back up because some people are going to be mad because I, have I haven't really explained the basics here. These beings have a hierarchy, hierarchy system, and they all have names that seem to be carried over throughout cultures in history, and they're all the same beings. And there are, there's about 300 of them, so there are many, many, many that have had names all throughout history, and it becomes so difficult to, to figure out who's what. So let's just cover who's the most important and, the, and who has been the most significant in these stories. And what you find is it comes down to this area that everyone is obsessed with. You'll find out why. And it has to do with these two brothers. Anu, who the, who the Anunnaki are named after, who came originally from his, his um, hierarchy of On, the original member of this group of beings that seems to have come from somewhere that we don't even know. Maybe, maybe Orion or Sirius. We have very little information except for what's shown in the pyramids that's connected to these star systems. But we don't really know. All we know is they came here. And Enki, one of these brothers of um, these beings, created us in his image. But his half-brother, Enlil, became angry over how advanced we became. Simply because these brothers had, were given dual ownership of this realm. So Anu had two sons, Enki and Enlil, and they were half-brothers. And he said, okay, paraphrasing. Both of you essentially run this reality here. That's what, it, that's what it is. It's so much more than just this physical reality. It's you run this reality here. I don't care what you do. Just you run it. Figure it out. So Enki created mankind. Enlil was essentially in charge of the physical world. And Enki was then tricked and forced into ruling the underworld. Now, Willie, do you know anything about dimensions, the physical world, the underworld, how well versed in those, in those areas. Not, not too much, man. This all reminds me of like God and Satan though. This is like, it's like a, a more detailed version of what the, the fairy tale is. <laughs> story of Adam and Eve is this story where mankind is created and they're told by this God figure, you can't eat from the, from the knowledge of good and evil. The fruit, the fruit of, the, of the knowledge of understanding awareness. You can't eat from it because we don't, we don't want you to have awareness of who you are, okay? That's what that really was. Yeah. And this serpent figure in this Garden of Eden story says, actually, they should know. They deserve to know. But wait a minute. The serpent was the evil one, right? That's where this whole story starts to unfold and gets deeper and deeper. Mm. So much of this information that we're about to go over was inverted to its opposite meaning later on by the church and put us in this state where we are in such a state of confusion now that we have to try to set the, the, the record straight. This image of Satan was what became of this responsibility of Enki. He basically became demonized. He was the serpent. And then this figure, Enlil, who is this God figure in the story, he was the God in the Old Testament. So, wait, wait, back up for people don't understand. So the Old Testament, when it refers to God, it's not really talking about God. It's talking about this hijacked character who is very warlike and controlling, and he doesn't want people to have awareness. That's Enlil, this brother. And that's where this whole thing comes down. Enki and Enlil ended up assuming roles that are based on polarity and duality, meaning one would be based on basically good, and higher consciousness and expanding us. And one would be based on deception and keeping us ruled by ignorance and control. And those two brothers formed what became this dualistic reality that we exist in. Damn, they, that is they, so heavy, man. <laughs> that's uh, game-changing stuff right there. Wow. And, but that's where this figure of Satan and, and, uh, and yeah. angels, demons and God and all this stuff came from religious text is that these creator gods started arguing over the, what they wanted us to become. And some of them were jealous because of what we really were and how we could be greater than them. So Enki and Enlil had sons 
and daughters. And there was this whole hierarchy system. Okay. And what, what basically ended up happening was when we look at what makes up the nature of our reality, and that's where this all really goes to, because you're not going to understand any of this unless you understand reality. Okay. Mm -hmm. The nature of reality. There is what's known, Willie, as different dimensions. Okay. Dimensions have to do with states of awareness has to do with states of awareness of consciousness within the multiverse, the universe. Okay. Now metaphysics, when we look like string theory, getting down into the, the deep physics of vibration energy, you learn that everything actually is on a state where it's non-physical. What that means is when we're, you're looking at me right now, you're seeing a physical image of me. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you die? You are, is it all over? Do you take a dirt nap? And then you never, you're, you never have energy that goes anywhere. Remember, Willie, the first rule of physics is that energy can neither be created or destroyed. It, sh it simply changes state. Wow. Meaning that when you're thinking and you're having a state where you can feel emotional connections to things and you're, you're closing your eyes and you're pondering reality, pondering things, that's consciousness. Okay, that's you. That's the essence of what you are. Remember the story I read of Achahasis? Let a ghost come into this physical being. That's consciousness. So they basically animated this being so that consciousness would become, um, would manifest into it. And boom, and there we are. That's what reality really is. Energy on a spiritual, eternal level that we are in a physical world, experiencing physical consequences. That's what this reality is all about. So here we are, we're a spiritual entity, just like these beings. And we are in a physical body in what's known as the third dimension. The third dimension is where matter becomes physical in a way where we can perceive it around us. Okay. But there are a lot of other dimensions, Willie. There are at least nine dimensions. There are dimensions below us and there are dimensions above us. And that simply means, let me give you an example. If you went into, if you saw like a yogi or a shaman go into a deep meditative state, right? Um, and they go into some kind of an out of body state where they, they, where they talk to something or they get information. Mm -hmm. That's another state of reality. It's real. It is absolutely real. And it's what these tablets in ancient stories talk about all throughout them is that what we perceive here as reality is just one certain aspect of reality. It's just the physical reality, but there's a lot of else going on around us. That's non-physical. And that's where these beings come into play. They got, they became so advanced long ago. We have no idea where they came from or who they are, but they became so advanced that they conquered reality and had the choice of manifesting in a physical reality or not. That's where, this, that's where this comes down to us understanding our role here, okay? That's why they created us here, so that we could toil here in the third dimension. Now, Willie, I wrote my last book. I don't know if you're familiar with this. My last book that I wrote is called The Stage of Time, because it's called that because Shakespeare wrote that we're all like actors on a stage. And by a stage, I mean the third, third dimension. And we are the ones that take an idea, right? an idea and we make, make it into something real, right? If you had, if you're sitting there and you're pondering, you're saying, I'm going to, I'm going to create a new city unlike anything that's ever been created and you, and you're able to do it and you have the support, you can create something that's never been done before. Right. And, and then have it actually be something tangible and real. That's our relationship here is that we can take thoughts and then create something with those thoughts. Okay. So therefore, it became a game of controlling information in our thought processes because we're like creators here, if that makes any sense. Yeah. We are so intelligent that we go out and we create all this stuff, civilizations, cars, computers, bombs, genetic alteration on things. We, we create all this stuff and then it becomes a real thing. But there are a lot of other dimensions that are outside of this. And that's where dimensions come into us understanding what our role is here and what the role of the Anunnaki is here and how this whole thing came to be. So what they basically say is 
there were these different groups of hierarchy beings that all had certain ideas of how they wanted society run here. And they, they got into such a battle, such a struggle over that future that it literally turned into like a war in the heavens, just like the biblical version talks about. A war in these higher and lower dimensions where these gods were like fighting over how we would turn out. And how did that get manifested? Empires battle each other over their gods. They would battle and go to these thousands of human lives were sacrificed all just so that these certain gods were appeased, right? And, and that's how this relationship went. And you learn, you really see that one of the tools that's been used against humanity is keeping us in a constant state of conflict, war, to keep us just div, 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 division and battling each other and always just always fighting. And that's um, where a lot of this interesting aspect comes. And Jeffrey might have mentioned it, where these be beings became so divided on either side, this big dividing line where they, be, they took on these symbols to represent themselves by. And then civilizations would show images of those symbols based on who they were influenced by. So when you see the serpent or the dragon and you see a, the eagle, those became the two most powerful symbols of the ancient world. And then the lion also became a very prominent symbol as well. And then today you see all these countries around the world with flags that go all the way back to these past empires. And you see a story that, that, that continued on about how that society was developed, what they became focused on. Now, what does the eagle mean? Well, if, you, if you're in America and you get this education system, that doctrine that you're told, you're told that the eagle represents freedom and peace. But that's not what it means at all. That's not what the ancient world had it mean at all either. Think of these two symbols as what's known as duality, the dualistic nature of our reality here. One, the serpent or the dragon, represented the spiritual essence of who we really are on a non-physical level. How does that serpent have anything to do with it? Have you, have you heard of kundalini or the energy of any of the things that yogis talk about with, with uh, chakras or energy or anything like that? Uh, very little. Well, what it, what it means is if you look at human energy on like a machine and you scan mm -hmm. it, we have like a coiled energy in our spine, okay, coiled energy. And we have the ability to unlock higher states, higher states of consciousness and higher states of physical health. That's the, through the system of, of in, internal DNA within us. We have that. That's what's known as the serpent energy. And the serpent represents wisdom knowledge, which is a non-physical thing, right? Knowledge and, and information is not a physical thing. On the other side, the ego represented hierarchy, awareness, and control over everything around it because the eagle is the bird that flies the highest. It has nothing to do with eagles. Eagles are beautiful birds. It was a symbol that represented a being or the viewpoint of overlooking something and, and being above it. And so you're always way ahead of it and you can perceive everything above way beyond it and it became a symbol that represented conquering of the physical world the eagle coming down and attacking it was a symbol for war it was a symbol for empire building and for those who don't believe me and think that i'm full of crap go look at nearly every warlike empire in history go look at the, the, the flag that the roman empire had go look at the nazis Go look at the ancient Spanish flag, a lot of the ancient Ottoman, Ottoman empires, and, and today the United States. The eagle covers nearly every one of the cultures that had a focus on empire building, meaning turning into a warlike militarized state where you conquer those civilizations around you. And then they had the symbol of the eagle. It's no coincidence. That's the symbol that represented that state of our reality, meaning, Willie, think about it an obsession over the material world, conquering a mater material things, developing wealth. That's what the ego represented, whereas the serpent represented knowledge and, and seeking the, the non-physical sides of us, the spiritual sides of us. So those two things represent this, two, this divide that developed between these beings, where some of them said, hey, this is a spiritual being here that's in a physical body, having a physical experience. If you make it too blinded by the physical world, you'll trap it here and it'll never understand what it really is. That's what this war became about. Because if, if 
focused on conquering the physical world, right? And you're in an army and you're charging in, you're going to battle and you think you're expendable and you just die. You're, you're making a decision based on how you want this story to go. Whereas, what if you weren't in that battle and you didn't die? What if you created an entire um, teaching system, like an ancient mystery school that taught about the ancient wisdom of the past and how to achieve higher states and how to build civilizations in a, in a way where they were balanced with the, with, uh, you know, the earth and, and the things around us rather than stealing and polluting everything and then conquering over everything. It became this struggle of two sides of what we could become. And those two sides are seen all around the world, Willie, in the Americas all the cultures like the Aztec and Maya, before they became corrupted, I will point out, have all kinds of depictions of serpents, dragons and serpents all throughout the Americas because they used to be based on a civilization that had the morals of what I just told you. Whereas other conquering nations like Spain, like the conquistadors, when they came over and conquered all the Americas, they were, had the, their crest was the eagle because they were the conquering force to come attack. So what, to make a long story short, it be, these symbols carried on all throughout our story, and they represent this struggle here on how this human story would go. We think that we're alone here in this reality, making our own choices. That's not what these tablets say, and that's not what the ancients say at all. They say it's more like, we're being, it's like a great reality show of a stage here where we're the ultimate entertainment for um, those who, the divinity of our true essence trapped in a physical world of conflict and deception so that we can ultimately, it's, it'll be, it's how we make those decisions and what, and what road we go down. For instance, I just want to conclude on this, Willie. Do we turn into a civilization that becomes warlike and destroys itself and destroys the planet? which is something that we find could have possibly happened in other civilizations based on the Drake equation. When a civilization reaches a certain state where they become unstable, they can destroy themselves. Or do we become a civilization based on the acquisition of knowledge and balance and then go, where do we go from there, right? Do we, do we eventually leave here and go visit some other world somewhere? And who knows? The possibilities are endless. But the point is, there's a battle over our story and the deception that we're nothing more than an evolved ape based on Darwinism and the, some of the control systems is this, is this great struggle here, when, which is what I try to point out is the Anunnaki, learning about the Anunnaki is not just about learning about some ancient beings that came here and influenced us a little bit. It is the whole story of us. It is how we became basically designed in the image of something that is much greater than just an ape something much more do you feel greater than if you saw like an ape in a in a you know a zoo you know chewing on a banana do you feel just like that ape or do you have complex um awareness of things that those the animal kingdom could never have right. you know awareness of the universe and awareness of of your body and how you can eat just right and then really get incredible health and then clear your mind and reach states that allow you to have clarity like you you would have never had before the possibilities are are endless absolutely yeah i used to work at a zoo and i worked with a lot of primates and they would throw fecal matter at us and they had one male that was very uh, aggressively masturbating anytime you came around with a woman so yeah we're definitely on a different level than they are <laughs> yeah i i know um, that that was a lot a lot of that was pretty deep um difficult to wrap people, some people's heads around, but I, I really encourage um, people to check out some of my work in the stage of time. I included a lot of these ancient translations. Go read them yourself. Study these, study these cultures. Understand that our story is so much more incredible than, than we're really told. And it allows yeah. us to really redefine everything, I think. Yeah. Um, I have a few questions for you if yeah. you have time. Um, yeah, absolutely. My co-host JP just texted me and he has a couple of questions he wanted to get in. Um, sure. Start with this. What civilization is the true Atlantis, Cuba, or off the coast of New York? I'm not sure what that means. Do you know what he's talking about? Yeah, I just did a show recently on my channel where I talked about how back in 2001, um, some oceanographers were serving off the western coast of Cuba and they found some incredible 
structures. But the structures were down um, thousands of feet underwater, in fact, 2,100 feet underwater, which, Willie, remember I said ocean levels were only 400 feet lower, not mm -hmm. 2,000 feet, which either points to the fact that those, those structures, which are clearly man-made in pyramid shapes and without a doubt, those structures seem to be part of a lost civilization that doesn't fit into this story we're told. It's, it seems to me after studying everything, um, looking at Edgar, Edgar Casey, what he talked about, looking at Plato and Timaeus and Critias and descriptions that are described of where it was, it was found, and then looking at places like Nassau, Bahama, and off of the Bimini Road off of, um, in the Caribbean and off of these discoveries off of Cuba, it really does provide some plausible um, evidence to show that it looks like something like an advanced civilization, like a place like Atlantis, Atlantis may have been located off of the Caribbean area and then destroyed and then thrust underwater and sank, which is what Plato describes it as. And it was lost to time. And I think that that was part of this global civilization that I mentioned. I think Atlantis wasn't just one place. There was a, some central locations, but it was, part, it was what I meant by a global civilization. And what evidence do I have? The megalithic building, the giant blocks, the structures that we find around the world that are so precise and are so different than what's built on top of it by the earlier, by the later cultures that were less sophisticated. Remember that gap between technology and knowledge that happened? Yeah. It proves that that knowledge is being shared all around the world. And that's why those symbols are shared as well, because that was being carried all around the world. Like in, in the Americas, the Maya had this serpent god called Kukulkan, and the Aztec had a serpent god called Quetzalcoatl. It's the same influence. But if it wasn't real, if it was just a, uh, a way to represent the seasons, like a rain god, then why would they have these detailed descriptions of this, this wisdom bringer that came to them and created their civilization and left? And they're waiting for them to return. That's what they state. So it tells me that there was, this, there was once a great global civilization that was wiped out and what we think of as Atlantis was most likely located either somewhere west of um, in the Canary Islands around Africa or off of what I'm now thinking is probably around the, the Caribbean. Wow. Okay. His, uh, his second question is, did Nikola Tesla come across a powerful, a power spot in the earth grid to create unlimited energy, which made the government kill him and take his notes? <laughs> Great question. So, <laughs> okay. Remember when I mentioned that location in the Caribbean that we found those ancient structures? When we also go around the world to a lot of where these pyramids are, places like Giza, Egypt, and um, around Peru, these incredible structures, Easter Island, um, off of the areas like near Cambodia, like Angkor Wat, and off of India, and around the world, we find that, wait a minute, these structures weren't built randomly just based on where there was good farming. They built them on what are known as energ energetic ley lines. Now, I mentioned how our Earth has gone through great catastrophes where the poles have shifted, right? That's based on a balance of electromagnetic energy. Magnetic energy. That, is, that has to do with each pole basically balancing itself, okay? But within, that, within our planet, we have these places where energy crosses. And those crossing points are known as ley lines. And where those energetic ley lines cross, these ancient structures were built. Okay, go into the Great Pyramid of Giza and go to the pyramids around it and do a little hit research and you find out that, wait a minute, we're told in our history books that they were built to house pharaohs, yet one, no pharaohs has ever been found in the pyramids of Giza. It's, it, it's just one lie after a lie. We know that all the pharaohs were, were buried over 400 miles to the south of the Valley of the Kings. So then what were the pyramids built for? Well, we find today that underneath them, there were aquifers that were used as some kind of electromagnetic connection to having an, a, a resource like water to act as a conductor, okay? At the same time, these structures are pointed in this perfect area right in the center of these ley lines where they have aquifers below them. And if you were to go in, you can actually resonate a, a certain kind of frequency within these pyramids that map that matches human consciousness, a certain hertz that matches the human consciousness, meaning these structures actually seem like they're built maybe as some kind of a balancer for the earth. 
let's just say you had disasters that are occurring on the planet and you knew that they were based on the disruptions of the pole systems. What if you created structures that could be built on these intersecting points of energy to try to balance them? And I think that that's one of the main purposes of them was to create a free energy system to balance the energy of the earth all over the place. Free energy, just from understanding magnetism, understanding electromagnetic grid of the planet. Well, Nikola Tesla came along, started t- studying ancient stuff, and he, and, he, and he rediscovered this. He didn't, he didn't discover it. He rediscovered it. And he realized that, look at us conquering the Midwest for oil and all these fossil fuels and all these massively powerful companies that are controlling so much of public interest and politicians and everything. And you find that, oh, wait a minute, we can just create free energy when we want to by using certain kinds of technologies. It's just one piece of this rabbit hole that's wound into all this stuff where all this ancient knowledge has been hidden and buried because it would completely change everything. Everything here. This system that's created here. And we can trace all the way back to these ancient kings who are told, Willie, in places like the, um, the legend of Atana, He's told that after the great deluge occurs, it says in there that he created the first city after the deluge wiped everything out, that the gods, these Anunnaki gods picked him because he had a certain bloodline to be this ruler and that they gave him these blueprints handed down to how to create a civilization in the image they wanted to be. So Atana says that he created Kish, which you can still find the ruins in, in, in Iraq today of these real places that existed where they had to create civilization again and it kept getting wiped out from all these different disastrous events that occurred. And your, um, your wealth of knowledge is so impressive. I feel like you, people like you should be protected. <laughs> you should be oh, your you. treasure. <laughs> well, thank you. I so appreciate impressive it. that you can spit out all this information, man. It's so, it's so much interesting stuff. Um, I have a couple of questions for you too, outside of our normal six questions. Sure. Um, so kind of tying into what you're saying about the, um, the, the false history of it all and what we're taught, how do you think would, would, if you had it your way, how would you think the best way to be to incorporate this kind of teaching into our schooling systems? Like, and what age group do you think it, it would be the most beneficial? Well, the first place we'd have to start is in school, we'd have to completely change this entire doctrine of what we learn. Mm-hmm. We should be learning based on a harmony with our planet. Kids should be in one of the first things they learn when they're in school after they learn how to talk and, you know, write and all those important things, mathematics, we need to learn how to grow our own crops. We need to understand our, our role here. Definitely agree with that. We need to learn how to define our experience here. Well, if we're in a, if we're in a conscious being here that is growing on a, on a, on a non-physical and a physical level based on decisions and things that we do, we need to be taught that that's important. We need to be taught the golden rule of we can affect people in a very negative way and it affects their whole life. Some parents need to be taught that how they teach their children is how they'll carry on to understand. It's, this, is a, this is not something where we're just here and we conquer and we take whatever we can in our life and then that's it and we just move on. We're leaving behind blueprints for future generations and we need to all understand that we're on a planet right now. Okay, let's set this straight. We're on a planet that's in a vast cosmos and we only have a certain amount of resources here and we can disrupt this planet and pollute it and and cause our own destruction here and demise. We need to understand our role here and and as stewards on this planet and then have a a viewpoint of what are we all going to contribute here? Does the person just learn this mundane version where they're like, oh, Go, be, go become a lawyer where you'll make the most amount of money or a doctor because you make the most amount of money. But what about things, you could do things here that maybe you really love to do. Maybe that you find that you have passion here about. And then we have, we'd have to have an entirely new system created where instead of people doing all of this um, massive amount of work, and I, I'm not someone who's trying to say we shouldn't be working, but we should have a completely different system where people we had a, like a global system here where everyone's encouraged to have their gifts be shown and 
to con- what they're contributing to a society, not just how much money they can make, make and subsequently have greed take over and then have a world where everyone's step on, stepping on top of each other and trying to get above and beyond just based on material wealth. I would have a school system teach an entire system where we learn that we're here essentially to help each other, learn goal, learn things for ourselves, learn um, how we can be the best that we can and encourage people to be something amazing and not just this mundane version of ourselves that right. could really be improved upon. I know that's yeah. a long time for that, but... No, that's that's actually awesome. I, I've actually touched on that recently on a, on a recent episode. My thoughts on that, that I think everybody has some kind of a special um, ability and natural gift that's with them that they should be channeling that and focusing on that in their life and their existence and not just doing the same thing like you're saying, just falling into a grid system and yeah. becoming a, um, another square, another block down the um, – this big puzzle, but, um, yeah, well, you, you basically said the same thing I've been saying to my wife too, just in a better way. That's really cool. I think that that's the, that's the, thank you. I think that's the, you can see that slowly, not everyone, but that's the direction that we're starting to take is starting to re re uh, determine our viewpoints of things. And and it's radically changing here all the time. And you, you can see it every day. Um, we're becoming less divided. We're starting to become more accepted slowly we're becoming better but it's it's happening with baby steps i think yeah that's awesome um my last question uh let's see it's kind of dark um well it's kind of a two-part question do you think we're going to repeat the same thing that happened to that first civilization that was advanced and went off the grid and do you think we're we're doomed for that as well i really don't and that's why i I like to that's a great way to end on a very positive note for people there's a lot of people very scared when they start looking into these cataclysms and they see that it's a cyclical thing they get really afraid that you know tomorrow we're going to wake up and everything's going to be destroyed Mm -hmm. and i think that there's like there's some few pieces of evidence that that really point that that's not going to be the case one 10 to twelve thousand years ago we had a massive ice age on the planet which meant that all that water that I mentioned that wasn't in the oceans, it was locked up in ice, meaning that it had the potential that if some kind of an event occurred with a massive warming, all that ice could just rapidly melt and cause all these issues. So that's not a factor anymore because we only have relatively small ice caps in comparison. Um, Antarctica and Greenland are tiny compared to what we had in the past. Secondly, it seems that we have technology right now that, um, and you, that's another entire whole rabbit hole, right, is how advanced some of the technology we actually have. And it really actually goes all the way back into looking at the Nazis and some of the advanced yes. technology that some of them had with Operation Paperclip and how the United mm-hmm. States went and got Nazi scientists and brought them back here. And there was all kinds of strange stuff. Like some have come out as far as to say that the Nazis, like almost like an Indiana Jones type of thing, studied ancient stuff, found ancient information and figured out how to make like anti-gravity type of technology. They were in the middle of creating advanced stuff when, they, when the, the whole thing collapsed in 1944 and 1945. They right. were, in fact, that's what some claim was the reason they really failed. It wasn't because they attacked Soviet Union, which is definitely a major reason, but it's because they became so focused on some of these incredible technologies that they, they, they had too big of a front to defend. And I'm Obviously, it's great that that didn't work out. Um, But what I mean is, when we later went into Operation Paperclip and took a lot of those Nazi scientists before they were thrown into prison, those Nazi scientists then were mined for information, and the United States got got a hold of a lot of advanced technology. And Mm -hmm. I think that those technologies have potentially been used, and I say potentially because we don't know, but when you start to research a lot of the bizarre stuff that's going on in Antarctica and the North Pole and the things that have been seen and a lot of the weird stuff with presidents just going down there and walking around, just visiting Antarctica, I think it goes a lot deeper. If the Northern, if the Northern Pole system, the North and South Pole, that's where that balance is potentially exists in North and South Pole where those, those pole shifts can occur and disasters then happen, it would make the most sense that you could potentially use some kind of technology on those to mitigate them. That doesn't mean, and, I, and to, to reiterate, that means that I'm saying that right now we're in that cycle. 
every, it seems like every 12,000 years, a sun goes through these changes and civilizations go through where a point where you can have things like greatly increased earthquakes and volcanism and giant storms all around the world, AKA climate change that seem to be going along with these disruptions that we're in being ent entirely told is our fault, which I always have to say this because people will say I'm not environmentalist. Us polluting our world is horrible for it, okay? Fossil fuels are incredibly destructive, but to blame everything on us would be to ignore ice core samples, looking at these snapshots of the climate and seeing that, hey, we've had jumps and drops, leaps and jumps in our temperature regime that pale in comparison to now, that make now look like a blip compared to 10 to 12,000 years ago when some of these events occurred, meaning that they weren't human caused, that they were from these cycles. What am I trying to stay there? We're in one of those cycles right now. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of the things going on with our planet that's, that are happening. And I, but I think that there's a lot of interest in this epic that we're in now to continue. And so I think the difference is when a lot of the ancient cultures state that we're actually prophesized to make it to the next stage and we're not supposed to be wiped out this time, that this chapter is the one that matters the most. No pressure for all those people that are living in this lifetime, but this may be the most important lifetime of all because this is the very moment when we're at a crossroads where we ultimately decide which path we take. One of becoming truly warlike and eventually destroying ourselves through our own technology or us becoming, changing our focus on something that's not war and something that's based on collectively growing as a, as a conscious species and then taking that, that route that takes us to the stars and takes us to higher states. That's what this, this moment is all about. Man, there's so many branches in the stuff that you just said from the tree that I would love to get into for a whole episode. <laughs> We're gonna have to have you back a lot if you're if you're up for it, man. Okay, that sounds great. You um uh, you have so much to offer. Um, okay, one last question. Um, where do you think the Anunnaki are now? It's a really complicated question. Okay. Um in leave me a, leave me a teaser for it then for the next episode. <laughs> okay. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, it states that Gilgamesh goes to seek immortality by f meeting the flood hero Zayasudra, which you would know as Atrahasis, that I mentioned the tablet from, who is the last king of Shrupak. See, all this stuff can be verified if you know how to point out certain key points of which cities were around at which point. Anyway, Gilgamesh says he finally meets um, Atrahasis, Untapishti, who he's called in the story. Remember, they have many different names. Mm -hmm. He states that he meets him in another realm. And he says that Atrahasis tells him a great story about how Sharupak and these cities were, were very, very old, much, much older than the cities at, of the time, like Uruk that he's in. And he states that they're so old that at one time the gods walked among them and were part of the civilization governing and being, a, being physical in their reality where they were in communication, but the deluge occurred the great cataclysms occurred on the earth and they fled our reality. It states that they left. Now I just did a video on this actually on my channel where I call I, I, that's the title of it. That doesn't mean that they left here on a completely non-physical way though. I think that our, our realities, if it's because there's higher dimensions and it's controlled by a lot more than what we think it is. I think there is still some control that's left from them. I think then that's why we're so governed still by so much deception and, and war and, and division because there is still this leftover need by some of them for us not to reach a higher state of consciousness where we will wake up and realize what we, who we really are. Thanks E. Willie. I really appreciated our discussion tonight. I hope that you got something out of it and I didn't overwhelm you. No, it was awesome, man. You opened a huge door in my brain that I'm excited to explore that room now. And I'm looking forward to the next time we can talk to. I know JP is going to have a lot of questions for you. This is something he's been excited about as well. There's so much that you went into that we could go, just go down so many different paths with. It. I'm, I'm excited to go deeper into it. That'd be great. I would love to sit down and talk to you guys again another time. Yep. I'm going to go subscribe to your YouTube channel right away too, because I am not already. 
And uh, we'll see you next time, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, E. Willie. I appreciate it.